I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guests today are Molly Merson and Lada Shiha. Molly Merson is a licensed marriage and family therapist with an accessible practice in Berkeley, California. Their work emphasizes the ways in which the constructs of race, power, gender, ableism, socioeconomics, and sociopolitical environments impact individual and community identity, well-being, and health. They are a candidate in psychoanalysis at the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California. Dr. Lada Shiha is a psychologist, psychoanalytic practitioner, scholar, activist, and president-elect of the Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology, Division 39 of the American Psychological Association. Her new book is Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, Practicing Resistance in Palestine, published by Rutledge in 2021 and co-authored with Stephen Shiha. On May 10th, Molly will be presenting at Psychoanalysis, Bodies and Diet Culture, the first event in a series that showcases some of the publications in the Counterspace section of the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society. Lada is co-editor of Counterspace with Jacob Johansson. The event takes place at 12.30 on the West Coast time of the U.S. and 3.30 of the U.S. East Coast time. This corresponds to 9.30 p.m. in South Africa, 8.30 p.m. in the U.K., and 7.30 a.m. of May 11th in New Zealand. The event is free and open to everyone. You can find links to everything, as well as links to Molly and Lada's websites and social media at the main homepage of Rendering Unconscious Podcast. That's renderingunconscious.org. Rendering Unconscious is also a book, Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. For more information, visit our publisher's website, trapar.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. As with all episodes of Rendering Unconscious Podcast, there is a video of this discussion up at YouTube. Just visit Trapar Films' YouTube channel. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa23Carl. Many thanks to our Patreon patrons. Your support is so appreciated. And thanks to all of our listeners. Uh, Well, first of all, to start by saying I love hanging out with you both <laughs> and I just want to say that publicly mm. same, same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited that we could do this exactly yeah so I maybe we've been I trying for months no right? definitely and I definitely yeah. want to promote Molly's upcoming event so maybe Laura you could say a little bit about counter space and what it is and then we can talk about the events that you're having yeah um so I'm super excited about Counterspace in general. I have been in a, for a while, but, um, and I think now it's starting to pick up where folks are like, um, know that it's out there. So it's really excited. But just for those who don't, um, Counterspace is a, I would say a subsection of the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society. And a real huge shout out, honestly, to Angie Viola and Michael O'Loughlin, who, 
really came on and, and sort of took the labor that folks before them had done and said, okay, how do we take it a step further, which is the best type of organizing, I think, is, you know, um, taking folks' hard work and saying, okay, what do we envision is the next step towards this? And so they had invited me and Jacob Johansson at the, at the time, Danielle Genzambidi, to start off this um, section, which used to be called field notes, and I think had become defunct at some point. And they were like, what do you all want to do with this? And we three were like, we want a space in psychoanalysis in one of the most, in the foremost journals in psychoanalysis to have a space where we can showcase and platform underrepresented areas of inquiry, folks who usually um, are, are gatekeeped out of the field, so to speak, um, non-formal academic um, submissions, because we all know the politics of academia and what it means, but still retain if folks are within academic spaces and we know, again, the politics of tenure and promotion, still have it be peer reviewed and within a journal that's um, recognized by institutions. So we really pushed for that. And they were just like, do what you want with this. And they were so excited and really provided us the platform to do that. So um, part of our vision was to say, what is the way we, how do we reimagine what constitutes psychoanalytic writing? What constitutes um, submissions? And, and how do we open up a space where people aren't having to like write 10,000 words for it to be an official you know, submission um, and to say what type of knowledge constitutes knowledge and what are the areas that we write about. And, and part of it comes out of our own experience of what, and you all know this too, what people's response to us is like, this isn't psychoanalysis or this is maybe a subsidiary of this or a hyphenated aspect of psychoanalysis. And our point in counter space was to say, no, actually this is psychoanalysis, but still have it be like a counterculture. That's why it's called counter space. It's, it's a counterculture to normative psychoanalysis because we are still in that space where there's a hegemonic sort of idea about what psychoanalysis is. So the name came from that and um, Danielle had to step down. So now we have Nicholas Millerby who's from South Africa and um, University of South Africa and awesome. And, um, we're kicking off these events now, which are showcasing some of the wonderful pieces that have come over the last couple of years. And we've had a lot of really amazing pieces submitted. And Molly's is one of them. Um, it's uh, it, And the event is called Psychoanalysis Bodies and Diet Culture. And it's in response to Andrew Dickinson, who's in New Zealand, uh, wrote a piece called Biomasochism, the Common Ethics of Weight Cycling. And we had invited Molly to be a discussant to this paper. So this event is coming up on May 10th and it's free and we can include the link um, when you put up the episode, mm. Vanessa. But um, yeah, I mean, we're just excited to have this represented, like talking about weight, talking about con consumer culture, talking about capitalism, talking about fat phobia, talking about the sort of racial histories of these things. And these are areas that to the best of my knowledge, psychoanalysis has not taken up very well. So um, counter space felt like the most, um, you know, apt place to showcase this. And what better way to do that than to have the folks who have put labor and thought and heart and body into this. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. And thank you so much, Molly, for saying yes. Oh, I would absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. There's no question. <laughs> and, you know, I think you, you invited me to consider, you know, responding to um, Andrew's paper um, because you know about like, you know, my um, love for strong man and um, <laughs> odd object lifting. And um, I've never been able to figure out how that fits into psychoanalysis, even though I know it does because they're both in me and like they both exist in my life and I exist in the lives of those two spaces. And so counter space is like such a great way to, it's like, it's like interdisciplinary, but like not just academically, right? It's like, you know, the notion of auto theory and auto ethnography really shows up in Andrew's paper and, um, a little bit in mine and, and then sort of the history of um, the United States and anti-blackness and fat phobia and 
um, yeah, that's all, it's all, I mean, it's all a part of the, the, the roots of it, uh, of everything here. Right. So, yeah. Right. And how could that not be a part of psychoanalysis? Like if we yeah. oh not issues, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I love counter space and I love the idea of it. Not that I would have a problem writing 10,000 words. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not that they would all go together or like make sense, but like, <laughs> that's not a complaint I usually get is like, oh, you've written uh, not enough. <laughs> but <laughs> no, that's, yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was an invitation. You know, I, I think some folks you're right at the, it's not a lack of having something to say that often is, but I think there's a way in which the way that academia is set up also there's, it feels intimidating at, at points yeah. to say, Oh, wow. I'm writing 10,000 words or 8,000 words or whatever it is, or a journal length article, all these ways we say things. Mm -hmm that like you're saying, you're like, actually, if I sit down and think about it, I have a lot to say, I can say this, but there's, a, it, it's a, not a neutral stimulus. It comes with a political mm -hmm. background. And I think a lot of people yeah. are rightfully intimidated because it signifies something. There's a, there's a gatekeeping mm -hmm. element to it. There's an idea about what constitutes academic writing, yeah. who, who has access to that, who doesn't. And I think that's where counter space came out of and I feel like the submissions we get like yours and like Andrew's are representative of like what happens when you invite people to lean into all the spaces of knowledge production that's within them and within their world like you're saying like if this is part of you then why can't this be a space of inquiry which is what, exactly what psychoanalysis is like Right. I know, I know there are ways in which we limit what people bring into our room. And that's part of my issue with psychoanalysis. But mm -hmm. in theory, we're saying everything belongs in this space. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I think there's an irony too of us calling it counter space because we're wrecking, we're marking also that like, hey, psychoanalytically, you say everything belongs in this space, but you really don't mean that a lot of the times. Yeah. You know? Which exactly. is where it's like contingent. <laughs> right. We just yeah, or it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all excited. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how it's, it's contingent on a particular developmental model, right? Like, and like, yeah, like also the sort of like beefcake notion of strength sports, right? Is like, that can't be thought. Like there's no thinking in that space, right? But what I'm hoping to do is bring an inquiry into these spaces where our bodies are doing the thinking. It's just maybe not accessible by a psychoanalytic, you know, typical normative psychoanalytic processes. And I think a lot of people have written about that, how the body is so alive and it has its own mind, you know, as though that's a separate thing, you know, mind and body. <laughs> so like even rewinding, you know, to Descartes and, and just like, you know, global politics of extraction and you know all of that it's like the colonial enterprise is very much about that separation and yeah. you know um yeah and and psychoanalysis is very invested in like a sort of like developmental growth model that like when you put that next to capitalism it's like grow 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 until what like <laughs> yes here we are you know yes so yeah and grow, 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 grow. Hey, but not this way. <laughs> Wait a <Yeah>. second. <laughs> <laughs> That's you not growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, and I've also always been frustrated with a lot of journals and like the idea behind like who has the right to speak about what. Um, mm -hmm. Like I was asked to guest edit a journal that I will not mention. Um, that I generally like, um, but I had uh, someone I know uh, wrote a piece about crip culture and they were like, well, they need to do like a whole background about, you know, you know, disability politics and all of this kind of thing. And like, where are they coming from that they uh, are able to speak on this? And it's like, they're coming from their personal experience. <laughs> And yeah, they they just like the the people who were overseeing my guest editing of the journal just like had the biggest problem with this. 
uh, because I guess they felt the person wasn't like credentialed in the way that they wanted. And yeah, so I just quit that too. But I find that so frustrating. It's like, why does someone who's speaking from their personal experience have to like back up what they're saying with like all this research about a field that they are living, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's just insane to me. Yeah. I well, that's like sort of what Molly was saying, right? The disconnection. Because for me, it's interesting because people end up reading that as a defense, whereas I see the like the infusion of space between the personal experience and like, oh, you need to do a literature review. No one's saying that background knowledge and sort of thought is not important and sort of uh sort of naming the people who did the labor to think through these issues, but to, to, in, to say that somehow their lived personal experience is not as important as that, or that it disqualifies them from talking about it. Or, and also what you're, this is the whole point of like, not this way, sorry, is mm -hmm. they're, they're also communicating that there's a right way to do this. And I think that's the point mm -hmm. is like, you are, have a fantasy about what this looks like. And that fantasy is ideological and it very much also then streamlines a particular type of academic and a particular type of writing while you get to like maintain innocence about it because they come, I'm, I have a sense they came back to like, well, this is just like good academic writing or this is the way we do it, you know, so like hide the way we do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, but I don't know about you all. I'd much rather read from somebody who's, lived it and sort of talking about the way that they navigate you know existing in a world that demands so much out of them and in particular an ableist world that like that to me feels exciting to to read and feels moving and special in a way that like you know headiness <laughs> doesn't quite do it yeah that's what but i tend to mess. that's what i tend to read and i think we talked about this some other time when we were just chatting about, but it's like uh, they both are important, like you said, but it's the people that are only for this kind of very stringent academic way of doing things that want to exclude the people that are not and not the other way around because the people who right. have lived experience are like perfectly happy for people to research fields and do whatever they want to do with that thinking and writing and research and, you know, perfectly happy for people to go you know, to university and study philosophy and just think for a living. And that's great, you know, but it's sometimes those people who have a problem with people not doing it their way. Yes. Yeah. Who's doing the excluding, right? <laughs> I'm also thinking about source material, right? Like the notion of like somebody else already said it, somebody else already did it. So pull from that. When it's your lived experience, then, you know, we are source material. Like that's a weird way to put it, but like, you know, it's our lived experience and our own theorizing of that, right. And our own experience of that. Um, right. Why isn't, why isn't this, you know, uh, accounting the thing that's cited. Right. Right. Which is what's great about counter space is that now it can't like now it's in print. It can be cited. My paper's already been cited by somebody, which was cool to find out, you know, but it's like because of that, you know, opportunity to now this is source material. This is, you know, right. some uh, singular. Yeah. Well, and I think this is the part is like to, to Vanessa's point and to your point is that when we. I think the dishonesty is the hardest part for me because when we talk about source material, we're also talking about this is the way that these things get replicated about who gets included in a particular field and who get who is central knowledge and who's periphery periphery knowledge around this. Yeah. Sort of it's not just a oh just cite everybody because if that were the case, then we'd be citing everybody who's writing about this. But when we look at who gets cited over and over and over again, the politics of citation, wow, remarkably, the people who are left out are not the people who, number one, for me, usually the people who have the most um, sort of moving aspects of this, like you're saying, Vanessa, like people who have firsthand experience of these things, but also it falls on racial, gendered, class, ability lines about who ends up getting it's, it's a self-repeating pattern of who ends up showing up in these source materials. And so for me, I'm like, I don't, you know, you've lost your privilege of like saying, this is the way we're, we want to do this because over and again, we see who actually ends up showing up. And of course, 
I mean, I don't need to tell you all about like curriculum in, in institutes or all these people aren't showing up. So at, at what point do I have to look at you and be like, I'm suspicious when you tell me this is, <laughs> this is the people I need to be citing because if I don't, then I'm not a good scholar, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What if we just cited whoever moves us <laughs> rather than from the approved list of citations? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, it's like, it's a, when I'm thinking about my citation list, I'm also thinking about that as a political intervention. Mm -hmm. So it's not yeah. that I don't know that people have done work on this. And I, it's not that I, like you're saying, Vanessa, that I don't think it's important. I'm also thinking about a radical re redistribution of like platforming. And that's an mm -hmm. actual political intervention to be like, hey, I've, it's again, I'm, yeah, I've read your work, but like, you're not reliant on me to cite your work for you to be relevant, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But other folks have done so much labor and nobody cites their work. So it yeah. becomes a political intervention in and of itself about what's the, uh, for me, it's a disciplined political act that holds me accountable to not regurgitate the things that are just available to me from an ideological standpoint but also to be actively involved in uplifting people who are doing really important work. And so when you, when I go through and write something, I am actively being challenging my own limitations as being somebody who was reared in these practices, right? In uh, North American academia, in these sorts of things, in, in the demands that are on us about what constitutes a scholar, I'm always pushing up against that. And mm -hmm. to be honest, I feel like that is what has really enlivened my work. I love what I do because I get to go to those spaces and because everything I do, whether it's writing or counter space or it, you know, speak that they're political interventions, right? And they, and they represent the type of world I want to live in. Like I'm, I'm trying to constantly what is the way I can relate to the world that aligns with the one I dream up alongside people like you all, right? Which is why our ongoing chat <laughs> <laughs> offline here <laughs> is helpful. <laughs> yeah, and I think about your, you know, I've got to witness you with your students at the uh, Division 39 conference, you know, and just how many people you've been able to, like, who's been able to be in that with you and um, just the way you shape your your own syllabi and, and courses that you teach, I can only imagine it's just like so, I mean, it feels like so nourishing in this like deep, deep way, just when I imagine, um, given what I know of, of what you've been able to do and, and where your ethos is, you know, just like the world that you want to live in, you create that, Lana, and I'm so, so grateful. It's just, ah. Uh, like, because sometimes, I, I mean, even when I sort of take that same approach, you know, and I live that, that same approach, it feels very different in some cases when I'm not met, you know, uh, by like, yeah, we're hungry for this too. Interestingly, my, you know, folks that I teach or, or supervise tend to be very interested in it. So that's great, but I don't often feel that from like that sort of next layer um, often right of uh yep. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes we can say it <laughs> i'll say it <laughs> yeah so anyway you inspire me quite a lot with uh you know what everything you're saying and and what you do with your world yeah thank you i mean likewise this is this is part of it right but i tend to feel thing because i know that's something that like the, I think this is what we're doing. We're constantly building the world that we want to see together. I know this is a conversation we always have, right? Mm -hmm. Here's this, like the larger, we get this pushback from larger thing. And we sometimes get in like, well, you know, that's what psychoanalysis looks like. And then I love Vanessa right before this and we'll put you on the spot. You're like, but we're also psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. right? And I yeah. think that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like what this podcast is. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine if I had this podcast when I was 
coming up, you know? Oh my gosh. That would have been nice. <laughs> Not for me, but for me as a listener, I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, there was no space like this that I could find. Yeah. What would you have wanted to hear? Ugh. Anybody, anybody else than what I was hearing? <laughs> oh there's just yeah any kind of thinking out of the box at all it was so it was so rigid and just like ancient ancient archaic rigid dogmatic yeah well it can also like you've always been an artist too right so like which is so bizarre to me because I'm like if psychoanalysis is not art and artistic like what are you that just shows you because I can't imagine that they were like cool yes do your art and this is central to psychoanalysis no not at all I think I shared with you too that when I I wrote that paper on data and psychoanalysis and uh that was for like a candidate contest in in the institute and they were just like what is this (laughs) you know and then I was like I don't know I thought it was interesting (laughs) Uh, I guess it wasn't yeah what what they wanted to have me be writing about but then like I said then when I met Carl I uh, I gave him the paper he said oh do you have anything that might fit in my my journal and I was like well I have this piece I wrote on data and psychoanalysis that nobody seems to like and he's like oh this is great and then yeah that just led to all sorts of things so yeah it's nice to know that there are home for these ideas it's just not not where I was yeah I mean I just feel like psychoanalysis has a compulsion to be irrelevant <laughs> because like that, I mean, they were leftists and they took up psychoanalysis, right? Artists were doing that. So, yeah, I don't know why. I really don't understand how I don't, I don't understand the institutional kind of super death drive of the psychoanalytic field. <laughs> um, because that's the thing that kept me attached to it was because I had had my own analysis while I was in grad school, like getting my PsyD. And then I was like, oh, I want to do this for other people. But my my experience of psychoanalysis as an analysand was so liberating and like completely changed my life. And then when I got to the Institute, I was like, what is this? You know? <laughs> like, this is not what the experience I was having. And then I had a training analysis, which was also like, not the same experience as the analysis that I had before. And I was just like, is this what's happening in the field? Uh, yeah. So it's just like my experience of the practice and then the experience of the field are like so different. And yeah. I don't understand this kind of ri- yeah rigid death drive that the field seems to have. It's like it has such potential to be liberating and creative. And I don't really don't understand why it keeps ending up like stuck in these structures. Like even with the Lacanians, like I said before, like I think the greatest thing about Lacan, like great, you know, to me, his seminars are great to read, but it, it's him talking. And then when I talk to other people about it, they're like, no, he was very precise about this and this. And I was like, when I read it, I just hear like, he's just talking. Like he's talking, of course he's had ideas he's been thinking about, but it, to me, it seems like he's like learning what he's saying through the act of speaking, which is psychoanalysis, you know? That's what I see when I read Lacan. Um, and then the fact that like the greatest thing is that he got out of the institutional structures and like, you know, kept trying to form new groups and then it kept turning into the same things. They finally like ended it right before he died. Then of course the people that pick it up, you know, just try to keep re-institutionalizing it. And I just don't understand this kind of compulsion to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's called white supremacy. (laughs) I can't, I can't keep it in. <laughs> yeah, but, just keep excluding every everything and everyone else. You know, yeah, because if that goes un, you know, marked un again, unanalyzed, you want to, I can use your language, you know, as a field, but I, I really do think that's part of it. Is you, you're Stephen has this great line. He's always saying is like psychoanalysis. And, and, and it's not homogenous, I'm not trying to, but the way that we see it enacted in institutes, particularly in North American institutes, but elsewhere too, as you're saying, 
is this sort of like you're far more um, invested in being an authority than you are in being relevant, right? And when you are invested in being an authority, it comes with purity politics. It comes with all these sorts of things, which is like, that's an extension of white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. When you try to say that Lacan was the first at everything, like why, when you need to make people into everything you need them to be, to that is for me a huge red flag about like what are you trying to invest longevity in? You're you're like you're you're feeding what I would call like settler futures. Like you're 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 invested mm-hmm. in a white supremacist future when you're constantly mm-hmm. rather because your fear of annihilation of the way things were like that. I have a like a like a parallel to that in the real world. And so I can't help but read this in these ways constantly. You're constantly imagining a future where you are a central piece of that. You as in like universal human, you white supremacist human, you and anything else feels dreadfully scary. And like people short circuit when they think, oh, this might look differently. You know, I know you have ideas about this too, Molly. (laughs) You actually wrote a paper about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I, right now my mind is churning. I'm cooking with a lot. Um, so, you know, we, we took that uh, sort of long seminar on uh, Afro-pessimism where you taught with a few other folks, right? And I attended, but um, I didn't read fully the book. And it's like been in my ever-growing stack of to read fully. I found it on um, a audiobook and I've been taking walks and listening to it. So it's like, it, like, cause I've read it in pieces and parts, but anyway, I'm, I'm soaking it in, you know, this notion of social death, right. And, and that blackness is death so that whiteness can have life, you know, or, or non-black can have life and how that's intertwined. Um, you know, so I'm just chewing over certain things, still processing, still digesting, but um, thinking about what you're talking about, about what's so important to hold on to and what's so important to preserve. And this notion of not not naming the, the necessity of like, we have to hold on because otherwise we might become proximal to blackness. Otherwise we might cease to exist. And what would that be like? Oh, no, no, no we know what that's like so we're gonna hold on and and you know entrench and and exclude and and delineate and you know in in my um realm you know with the folks that I talk to one of the things I hear often is this anxiety around wild analysis and I'm here I am trying to rewild my yard you know and I'm like yeah like what's wrong with that (laughs) yeah like and what does that even mean like I feel like analysis is quite wild Um, I'm reading, you know, right now, uh, Freud's, you know, thought transference ideas and and all of that and all of the let's not talk about thought transference, you know, and this fear that's entrenched in all of it about like, um, you know, anything but anything but death, right? And that's what, that's what continues to reify the death. That's what continues to preserve the death. And um, Anyway, those are just a few thoughts in my I mind. And, and I wanted to, too, yesterday I went to a um, graduation at my institute, and, and it was the first time I went to a graduation. Uh, somebody presents a paper, and then somebody discusses it, and then everybody, you know, says, you know, congratulations. It's a really moving event. And I noticed that the person, I loved what they said, and there was, but there was no mention of white supremacy. There was no mention of whiteness as like a thing we're trying to hold on to, you know, it was um, there, it was just so completely missing. And, and it's so interesting how we can go to these very rich places psychoanalytically and not mention white supremacy, whiteness, whiteness value systems right. at all. Right. Right. Yeah. This is where I always say, I'm just so fascinated by like that drive, what, you know, what Vanessa was saying is like the death, the super death, death drive or, right. like, you know, ensuring futures or whatever this is that the basis of which is white supremacy is that like you're a field that believes in the unconscious. And then there's these ways in which like the unconscious stops 
being real to you? Like <laughs> the fact that you can say you're worried about wild psychoanalysis and just repeat that and not recognize there's like unconscious meanings to when you say the word wild, like none of us are confused about that. I hear that and I hear a racial yeah what dog whistle and I'm like uh so like the hordes of brown and black and indigenous people came in and like upended your and now we can't think coherently because all these people are here mixing us up and and of course they're yeah. like the the backwards you know just completely emotive irrational that's what I hear when I hear wild psychoanalysis and then if you say that people will be like well, I didn't say that. I'm like, do you, do you stop believing in the unconscious? Like at what point does this, the unconscious stop being unconscious, right? <laughs> Weirdly, it stops at the feet of white people. <laughs> in the maintenance of white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's my thing too. So I'm like, all, all these times I hear these things talked about it. And, and I'm thinking, I was trained to listen to this in a particular, like you trained me to listen to this in a particular way. And when I hear it as it's intended unconsciously, you gas like the fuck out of me. And you're like, but wait a second. You're just like, you're making this all racial. And I'm like, I'm using your method, <laughs> but your method, but here's the thing you're telling on yourself when you do that is you're saying, no, no, no. Your method wasn't intended to be used this way, right? Mm -hmm. You taught me a method. And in because of my own social location, I'm using your method to the end in which hopefully liberation, like you're saying, it can be liberatory. And then you're coming back and you're saying, actually, I didn't mean it that way because I meant it to be stabilizing, stabilizing yeah. for white supremacy and futures, right? And that's the, I think that's the conflict that ends up happening. Yeah. Makes yeah that makes a lot of sense. And when you were talking to about the, the asserting, they have to continually assert their authority. I just saw like the planting of all the American flags and the Israeli flags, like assert, 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 keep planting these flags. <laughs> yes. yes, because if we don't, we'll forget <laughs> might lose our ground yes you might you know those people you stole it from might come back and be like actually this is ours <laughs> that's what happens yes that's what happens that's in the right. yard that's, that's what, what, what happens asserting and asserting right. and asserting yep mm -hmm. yeah which is why i think you know oftentimes i'll, I'll have students rightfully so feel helpless in the face of these things and and the you know my line is, and I don't know if it's right, but this is what keeps me going, right? Is that it's, I am under no pretense that we're winning any revolutions in institutes or in Division 39 or in any one of these spaces. Like that's not the site of revolution for me, right? Mm -hmm. But it is a space of disruptance. Mm -hmm. it, is disrupting is actually part of the process. And it's, and, and it's also incredibly psychoanalytic, right? Is that it, to not let things go on being as they would, if you weren't there in your, in your mere presence, just to disrupt it. And if that's the, so there is something happening in that mm -hmm. moment that otherwise wouldn't happen if your presence are not there. Now, I'm not saying that in a way because that also has a material reality to be a, your mere presence being disruptive actually comes with material impact, especially if you're talking about racialized or gendered or classed or, or, or disabled bodies, right? That's, that's not an invitation to be like the, you know, um, the scapegoat constantly. And that's why community is really important because none of us can do that disruption alone, but there, if you're able to do so, if you have the space resource-wise and, and community-wise to do so, I think that is also an important piece of this. That is how we destabilize rather than stabilize. You're making me think about how just this uh, positionality within institutional life like literally makes people sick, you know, like because of that continual barrage from you know, multiple sides, 
it's I'm just thinking about you know people I know right and and also how crazy it made me right crazy right because I couldn't figure out what was going on even though I knew but I didn't know but I knew you know that kind of thing yeah. yes yeah just I think you know and sometimes we think about at least for me I know you we have fantasies about like movements or organizing being so grand and, and sometimes they are and they need to be and then sometimes it's like getting text messages from each other being like just like check me here <laughs> you know reality check me or here's what happened and then we you know are able to offer lifelines to each other to, right. co to continue in this disruptive especially if we've committed to that politically you know which again mm -hmm everything I do is a political commitment, you know? Yeah, and intentional. I like that idea of being more intentional about all these kinds of steps that you take and things that you choose to do and people you choose to cite and being intentional about it, making mm -hmm. it an act that way. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And this flies in the face of every stereotype about anarchists, which I love too. <laughs> And being an anarchist doesn't mean, you know, this the mainstream. It's anarchy. I actually know I'm quite intentional, and there's a lot of meetings that are involved. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <sighs> every space. I mean, you're right. It's every space. Yes. And here's the thing is like, I'm not saying there's, there isn't um, exhaustion that comes with that. But for me personally, as a racialized subject, as a, as somebody who, a, a colonized subject who now lives on stolen land, all these sorts of things, it's like that the option of not being engaged politically is far more exhausting to me. That's alienation to me, right? To, to live and not, so the struggle that at the end of the day, and I get people ask me this a lot, like, okay, but how do you keep it up? And I'm like, living in a world where I'm not constantly confronting the sources of alienation feels far more draining to me than being engaged and building community and finding spaces of breath and, and life and love within the oppressive, it's not like the oppressive systems disappear. They feel suffocating if I'm not engaged in that way right and, and but it takes it takes time to like find that out I don't, I don't know that in graduate school I mean I felt it viscerally I knew it viscerally like you're saying Molly like you knew it but you but you don't at the same time and there's all these sort of counter forces and then you don't know where your space is and um but I feel like that's where our friendships came out of too like how each of us became friends is a part of like finding that person and being like, fuck, I'm not alone. <laughs> that's okay. I'm not I here. There's another person that's like seeing and being with me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's like essential. It's essential. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel so lucky. I mean, just how fortuitous, you know, these encounters, you know. The, I knew that I was looking, but I didn't know that I was looking. I just knew I wasn't finding. And then I found, you know, and then I, yeah. and then it was like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yes. How to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm forever grateful to, I think foremost, my colleagues in Palestine and my colleagues in South Africa for teaching me what that means, you know, and what it means to, like you're saying, Vanessa, like the intentionality of it, right? It is, what is it me and my, of, of course, my colleagues in Palestine about how do you excavate, as Nadira Shalhub Kabukan says, places of living under intense oppression constantly right and rework what it means to thrive and create possibilities and create futures but also presence that 
um, both in present TS and presence as in CE, like staying <laughs> present um, to right against all this. And then in South Africa, my colleagues, whether it's Shahna Safla or, or Mohammed Sidat or Nicholas Mullerby or um, Garth Stevens, all, all of them teaching me that they don't do anything scholarly wise that's not collaborative. And they do that intentionally. They're like, there's enough shit out there that's like individualistic and all that, that this is actually a political act of community organizing through scholarship, you know? So um, just sort of keeping us space in because here in the context of North America, it's so, it's so crushing. <laughs> it can be so crushing, you know? Yeah, the hyper individualism and how, you know, like your papers don't count as much if they're co written. Yes. Or, you know, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And in this, this description too of like constantly making these choices, that's also very psychoanalytic because there's also this kind of idea in some parts of the field that like, you know, psychoanalysis doesn't actually really help anything and that you just get to a place where you're like, okay, I understand myself better, but it doesn't really change. And I find that really odd because like, why would people do it if it didn't help them feel better? You know, like that's what they're coming is for some symptom relief. And yes, you might get to a place where you understand, your, you see your patterns and you understand yourself better. And you realize like some aspects of yourself aren't really going to change. And you kind of learn to like work with yourself instead of constantly like trying to force yourself into these boxes that aren't really you. That I understand. But there is a point where like when you see your patterns that, that you constantly like feel drawn to do those patterns automatically. And then you make a choice. You, you get like space, at least in my experience through the analytic treatment where you like are like, I see myself going to do the knee jerk thing that I always do. And then I make a choice to not do that and to do this instead because I want to live my life in this way. And, and even like with, with the language we choose, changing our language to like be more inclusive and things like that. It's like, that, is, that to me is very psychoanalytic. So you can kind of do that in your daily life life all of the time with different things with personal things with political things uh to make these choices and be more inclusive and, and have these acts be part of your day-to-day -day life yeah so that to me that's very psychoanalytic as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and to be attentive like and rather than sort of localize that within the, the times where we can't make those choices rather than localize that with an individual, which I do think psychoanalysis does is be like, what are the forces structurally, right? And ideologically that might mm -hmm. uh, limit my capaciousness, my ability, my expansiveness, my ability to make choices in, in alignment with liberation, for example, mm -hmm. right? And that's, I, f I feel that that's part of the, the freedom as well is to be like, these choices are caught up in so much and whether it's libidinal energies or identifications or investments or um, internalize it, whatever, let's, any word you wanna use in psychoanalysis to describe this, that those are multiple in meaning and they come from capitalist desire and they come from, right, normativity, like that we're seduced into and that we're legitimately socialized into from when we're you know, kids into a particular normative state of being. And I think the choice then also, so for me, rather than, and I don't think you're saying this, rather than it be an individualistic choice to be like, what does it mean to work towards liberation? What it, whether, right? And that our liberated selves then hopefully link up with other liberated states of being, which is why I can't separate like the fight for Palestine from the fight for, South, you know, South Africa, from the fight for trans liberation, from the fight for all these sorts of things that are always linked up. Right? So our liberatory choices are not individualistic choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people will and say I in think... sessions sometimes like, you know, I don't know why I acted in a certain way in these certain dynamics and these certain relations. It's like, there's a, there's a reason why you're acting a yeah. way that sometimes people just feel compelled. They don't even feel like they're, you know, may, being able to make a choice in situations. Right. right. Yeah. 
I just keep thinking about, you know, the attachment to the rigidity, the, the attachment to the normativity, you know, as like a kind of um, uh, investment in a promise, you know, an investment in this notion of that we can get something if we do it a certain way. And if you don't do it a certain way, then it's catastrophe. And that, that I think that anxiety uh, really drives a lot of people to not want liberation. Mm -hmm. um, because liberation is um, actually maybe more equitable and less, you know, sort of, there's less of an investment in, like, if I do it the way I'm supposed to, I get the thing I'm promised, you mean which is white like how people who are invited into whiteness. People invited into whiteness, yeah, as a system, yeah. right? As like, I can have access to this thing if I do it a certain way, if I, you know, follow yeah. the rules or, yeah. you know, speak nice to the police, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think, I think uh, it's, a, it's a, in my experience, clinically, it's been very hard for people to, to like be willingly, like, de, you know, leech, <laughs> from that it's like a suction it's you know because yeah. um, it's yeah it's it's so part of our um everything yep yeah I often talk about this to my students but especially my Arab whether comrades mentees or students about like re actively reject talk about intentionality rejecting that seduction into whiteness right and I say this yeah. very yeah. clearly also as a light-skinned Arab right where I moved to the United States in graduate school and I learned the political racial codes in me I mean they were wow talk about you come in in your adulthood and then like if there's anything visceral it's like wow there's a really clear invitation here and like I felt it every step of the way I felt the invitation and how because I think now I can look back and I have the words for it my alignment with the liberation of Palestine and the struggle for liberation of Palestine provided even though I didn't know the words for it provided like number one immediately me being marked as not white but ironically also as like a space to invite me in further to defang the political elements of that. So people were like trying harder to be like, but you're actually not like them. You're actually not, you know, I didn't have an accent. I was light skinned. I didn't wear a hijab. There's all these ways in which like, now I look back and I'm like, wow, you really tried so hard. And now I can read it racially, right? And coming in and people trying really hard to be like, you are actually white. Like one person actually told me, why are you disavowing your whiteness? And I was like, I believe that you would first need to be white to disavow some <laughs> like that actual meaning means you had it. And then you, but I'm not white. Like I'm not from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. I'm from Lebanon. In the, <laughs> I'm not why I'm just light skinned. Right. But, um, but it, it was remarkable because I had a different experience than maybe somebody who's born in the United States as an Arab which has its own history of being invited into whiteness and in which now we see overwhelmingly people fighting against this sort of, especially generationally, but like also post 9-11, a whole different configuration of what that means, right? But my call is always to Arabs, especially who are invited in all, all, oftentimes through class too, mm -hmm. and always configured in an, in an anti-blackness. And that's what you were talking about, Molly, right? Is you're always positioned, you know, against, in in a configuration of anti-blackness and of course by omission anti-indigeneity because you like don't even fucking hear about indigenous people right even though as arabs we should be the most attentive to these things because we know what it means to have a settler colony constantly be you know uh, dictating the way that you live your life but the the choice is intentional that is an intentional choice who are you aligning with and do you allow yourself to be seduced into whiteness to get the fruits that you were promised, but you will never fucking get? This is what I'm like, never I'm get the sorry. Fruit. You will <laughs> never get the fruit because the first step you take, I hear this all the time. Like when you stop being the good Arab, quote unquote, mm -hmm. that shit comes down hard. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was never the good Arab. 
Papa. <laughs> My mom would have been proudly the bad Arab. But I was, but I'm saying that because I was able to do so in a different way because I was not raised here. I was not raised in these racial codes that really work hard on you to invite you and in, conscript you and really keep the racial hierarchies in place. But it is an invitation to Arabs in particular, light-skinned folks in general, but I'm talking to Arabs because that's my community. But like, whiteness isn't yours. I don't give a fuck what you show up in the census. It's not yours, right? And if we're talking psychologically, what's the psychic price you're paying to constantly be searching for this, like, you know, this white fantasy that's not ours and that is based on the degradation of black and indigenous people. And like, that's, I, we just can't be, we're clear on who we need to be in solidarity with. And like, it's, it's time, it's, it's time folks, you're not white. <laughs> who do you recommend people read? Molly? We'd say that one more time. Who do you recommend people read? Right <laughs> Oh, three more of these things. <laughs> well, yes, for <laughs> beginners. <laughs> I have it somewhere around here. I can show it. Oh, uh, I think I put it in my. Um, oh my gosh! I mean, anything from Bell Hooks, we could start there. Anything from Franz Fanon. Anything from you know. I mean, a lot of you can probably. Yeah. If you want to find your book. Do you, well, uh, I would say my book is for, uh, especially for Arabs, right? Of like yeah. how to be a bad Arab. <laughs> That's my next, <laughs> our next project, Stephen and I's next project, the, <laughs> uh, toward being a bad Arab. Um, <laughs> That's, we need, we, we actually really have talked about writing that of like uncompromising, but yeah. And um, Molly, did you want to plug Deshaun's book too? Yeah, I have that right here. So a lot of you recommended this, uh, The Belly of the Beast, um, The Politics of Anti-Fatness as Anti-Blackness. Yep. So it looks amazing. Yeah. Um, Sabrina String's book that I cite in my paper, also Fear of a Black Body. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll link to all of these. Yes. And just like, I think part of what we're saying is there's also an, there's an interdisciplinary way in which we need to be involved and not feel like that's like us going outside the field. So like Sarah Ahmed's work, uh -huh. right? Yes. Um, right. Any one of these, are, these are central to what I always read and sort of think through black feminists, black decolonial feminists, um, mm -hmm folks that are really doing incredible and have always been doing incredible work that's not out external to our work of thinking through psychoanalysis in fact they have no problem using psychoanalysis we're the ones who have a problem using their work that's right that's exactly right I'm trying not yeah. to squish my dog if I go totally. get your book on. no and that that speaks to psychoanalytic neutrality in this argument they always have about neutrality and neutrality and somebody messaged me on instagram the other day and was like how do you have such an internet presence and still maintain analytic neutrality and it's like analytic neutrality means i don't judge my patients or tell them what to do <laughs> i don't tell them what to do with their lives or judge their choices or judge them that's neutrality. That doesn't mean I have to erase myself and become this like neutral figure. You know what I mean? That doesn't mean like, right. yeah, this is insane to me. It's like, it means I don't judge my patients or tell them what to do. Right. It's so interesting because so another person, Sophie Mendelssohn is a, a, a French psychoanalysis, a psychoanalyst and a leftist. And um, we were, we were, she was doing an interview with us about the book. And she said, actually, I love this like reading of neutrality. She was like, actually when it, you're neutral, when you have a commitment, like a political commitment. And she was talking about like in Palestine, if you're sitting in a room and tear gas is falling through, like what, how absurd is it to say, oh, I'm going to be neutral because there's a material presence there. And she was like, actually only after you've made the commitment, you can then be neutral. 
right? It's like there's an I yeah. the way I would translate that is like there are non-negotiable truths. There are non-negotiable yeah. truths that govern things about anti-blackness or anti-indigeneity or fat phobia or transphobia. Like these are truths, right? That we can emerge from there. And once we do that, then you're able to claim your beloved neutrality. But the, your neutrality doesn't mean you don't get to say those things are true. <laughs> It's not a silencing tactic. And I think like as a, as a, you know, when I was a therapist coming up, I kind of thought that's what it meant that you can't show mm -hmm. up. You can't actually be yourself in the space. And that's, it's, I, I, I completely agree. Yep. A lot of, it's like a, it's, you have to fully commit to your stance and your way of thinking or what you yep. might be listening for or whatever. And then that's how it gets to actually exist. Yeah. I think that um, there's this video um, of Fred Moten and Saidia Hartman talking with each other that I just, I've watched like 10 times and I love it. And I always think about it and it's kind of helped me with that notion also, interestingly, it's helped me with a lot of things um, just to add to the the resource list, <laughs> you know, Please and it's like, this thing, for that. yeah, I will. It's, um, it's called the black outdoors and it's like they're talking at duke university and about the black outdoors and it's just pretty yeah. phenomenal yeah yeah well also include your books vanessa because i think for me yeah. that's enacting yes. what is it what are the sp spaces where psychoanalysis exists and, and thinking through mm -hmm. and i am thinking through using lacanian ways of thinking without being pretentious about <laughs> lacanian ways of thinking um, in the context of the United States, I also want to plug um, Devin Atala's work and uh, Ormita Pajuta, who talk about um, refusal. They have a particular article about refusal, um, indigenous refusal, and it's like um, from Chile to Palestine and India as well, and they take up those issues. So it's like this stuff is being done. It's out there. It's just a matter of like what curriculum it shows up in. Um, a couple of years ago, I um, special edited a, um, studies in gender and sexuality called Black, Indigenous, and um, Women of Color Talk Back. And it was all about decentering normative psychoanalysis. And that was the point, Molly, earlier you were like, now it's out there, you can cite it. And I think that was part of our collective effort was what we hear a lot as uh, folks of color is like, well, we try to find somebody, but like you, you, you all aren't out there yet. There's always the, and so it was talk about intentionality. It was sort of like, not only are we out there, we actually have nine people in this, uh, you know, journal and each one of us are talking back to these ideas. And so it's out there. There's a whole journal. There's like no more excuses for people to be like, oh, you people don't write. You know, you people <laughs> don't write at all. We don't have any ideas, right? We're just like, we're mimic, we just mimic everything from Eurocentric um, ideas. So there's also that. And that the, I and I'm saying that, like, forget about my introduction. That's nothing on the beautiful voices that are platformed in this um in this edition and i think everybody needs to know those names in psychoanalysis you know mm -hmm. um out of the uk you have gilan kinwani who's mm -hmm. fucking awesome and doing great mm -hmm. work luke taylor um mm -hmm. gail um um oh my gosh i'm blanking on her last name i'll find her last name but um gail lewis oh and, lewis yes yeah yeah, right. um, just amazing work. Ian Parker, mm -hmm. Erica Berman. I mean, folks are really showing up and they're explicitly themselves and anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist and anti-colonial. And like, it's an exciting time to be in the field if we're also not like getting bogged down by all these, re th these you know, seductions of normativity. Um, Hannah's even a couple folks, Michelle O'Brien and um, others are starting Parapraxis magazine. That's very cool spaces to like talk about these issues. And they have about, um, I think they're, now their seminars are coming out was like dismantling the family, right? Yeah, you're going to be presenting, right? Yeah, on Fanon. Um, yeah. Through that, but they, 
I mean, this is just like their first foray into this. And it's, and it's wonderful because this is the whole point is like when you're, when you're thinking about psychoanalysis and the centrality of Oedipus, and then they're coming at us and they're just like, actually, let's abolish the family <laughs> because, and that's, that's my gem, right? Is like, how are we thinking through these things? And they have so many amazing people on that. So I'll link that to Vanessa about these upcoming seminars. And then you start to see who's talking about this stuff. You know? Excellent. Yes. Oh, this is Lada's book, by the way, if anyone wants to see yeah. what it looks like. And I'll link to that episode <laughs> as well. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I saw Gail Lewis present uh, and I just like <laughs> have this bad habit of taking notes on post-its. So, but I have post-its all over my <laughs> table from everything she said. It was so yes. incredible. Yeah. She's amazing. Very alive. Yeah. 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 There's the a, worst there's, is alive. It told, there's a YouTube video that I'll actually link to Vanessa, Vanessa as well of um, Gail Lewis and Feluke in conversation. Oh. Yes. Oh. Talk about like mesmerizing because like. Any- oh, gosh. It's Two of my so favorite people. Amazing. And I love the um, the contradictory clinic um, interview or panel that you hosted, Lada, that one I, I often share with people as well. And and Dr. Jones, Annie Lee Jones and Felipe Taylor and, and the way they have a conversation with each other. And yeah, um, yeah it's that's also really. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So don't despair. <laughs> we have lots of resources. <laughs> Exactly. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we wrap up? <sighs> I love you. I love you. <laughs> yeah, I love you. It's so good to do this. I wish we could do this every Sunday. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, we can make it a regular, regular event <laughs> every few months. We'll tell everyone how we're feeling. <laughs> Up. <laughs> and what we're reading yeah I love that. a public a public catch up and a, pu- a public accountability yeah i'll just say yeah. today accountability is- corner <laughs> yeah. today is mumia abu jamal's 68th birthday um wow. so all power to all the people free all political prisoners um including george abdullah in france and um but really Put your voice behind Mumia and um, this is part of our struggle too. Abolition is part of our struggle. That is where I will end it. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Molly Merson and Lada Shiha. Please join us on May 10th for the event, Psychoanalysis, Bodies, and Diet Culture, the first event in a series showcasing some of the publications in the Counterspace section of the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society. Molly is one of the presenters and Lara is the co-editor of Counterspace with Jacob Johansson and I've already got my ticket. The event is free and open to everyone. It takes place on Tuesday, May 10th at 1230 West Coast US time, which is 330 East Coast US time, 930 here in Sweden, 830 in the UK, and 730 AM on May 11th in New Zealand. See you there. You can follow me on social media at raw sin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore on Instagram and Twitter. I also have a TikTok where I post clips from Rendering Unconscious Podcast as well as other videos. Visit me at Dr. Vanessa Sinclair 23 at TikTok. 
for links to Molly and Lara's websites and social media, as well as to the event and links to some of the books and discussions and videos mentioned in this episode, you can go to Rendering Unconscious main website, renderingunconscious.org. All the links are there. You can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net. For more with Molly and Lada, you can check out previous episodes of Rendering Unconscious podcast. Rendering Unconscious, episode 62, Molly Merson, psychoanalytic therapist, interrogating whiteness. Episode 43, Lada Shiha, psychoanalytic practitioner, scholar, and activist. Rendering Unconscious, episode 143, psychoanalytic activist Lara Shiha on the pandemic, Palestine, Black Lives Matter, U.S. imperialism, intersectionality, and community, and Rendering Unconscious episode 185, Lara and Stephen Shiha on Palestine, psychoanalysis under occupation. And now a song from the album, The Pathways of the Heart, for Jessica, entitled Transition, Portal, Lunar Eclipse in Gemini. Enjoy. circles arranged in their demands, are unconcerned with our feeling reactions. Pleasure constitutes a danger, even though it should correspond to a natural. Who are involved in the treatment process? When a high score occurs in the, if the person chooses to hide problems, Psychotherapist and Gunter others. Bruce. That name Bruce is and not such holistic activity as you may find, but deed or invent. Because the name takes us visible into on my reality or as the first day of every sacrum being was the road. You'll discover fantastic new ideas to wait. I must dogmatically step by step guide you and conclude that the personal psyche is governed by an interpretation of the view of life. Use and the visceral attachment to sorrow, art, from a serious vein, blood made us to the historic prototype of either man alive, knowledge that there are actually, we all love as natural in her veins. There is a day an individual then I guess individuation and we can that poor is a marker adjustment. Whether that or not analysis what the situation is a, is still not so far over the skies that they slip further into inadequate. At the role of unconscious homosexuality, our men's right psychology never came to most important grounds of undeveloped voids. In and turns the eye into that apparatus for which every instinctual day, other image day, so that it is present one person, the but do not quite as forget, however, are of and from the demand for equality in the group. This reflects on the current feeling of the not experienced towards a substitute figure and their tributes. They all want to be ruled both to the emotions stirred by any many men 
as well to celebrate the summer solstice has an superiority complex. The always the presentation of light where the master is phenomenal they are somewhat rare in communion with one another. Generally, saint will let us spot Jan at first and or what was said above have broken table turning. Hold that society is very combination potential threat to words and the break from the two traditional narratives. Just as your friends let us gaggle your awful carbon, even say toxicity that there the is the archetypal selected factor recording involved in the enriched career essay. Let us call this an archetypal cross culturality and experimental writing and paracritical hinge.